I'm going to focus on the imaging itself and try to give uh, all of you a little bit of a primer on uh, what you might see. And the reason why I included this slide was just, say, just to say that the train has left the station and hopefully you can get on board. Um, take home point number one. On a PSMA PET-CT, everything that is hot is not prostate cancer. And this is a nice review article from uh, Radiographics that was published a while ago that talks about normal patterns of distribution. So this shows glandular activity, parotid, you know, submandibular lacrimal glands. You get kidney, liver, spleen, a lot of different areas where this is going to localize to. Uh, and it's because PSMA is expressed in so, some of those areas. Sometimes it just gets trapped there. But again, there's other areas. Even though it, says, it stands for prostate specific, it's not 100% prostate specific. Um, this, case, this shows examples of, of ganglia, so neural bundles that have uptake with PSMA PET. These are not metastatic lesions. These are just normal nerve bundles that have uptake. So it's something to be careful of. So if you see something mentioned up here in the retroperitoneum or presacral area, take a look, question, challenge. You know, I think it's a learning process for the radiologist and the urologist. Uh, so it's a, um, yeah, so be aware of that type of pitfall. You have things in the bones. You have like degenerative osteophytes that might have uptake. This, I remember the first time I saw hemangioma on a PSMA pet scared me because I was like, what the hell is this? But it looked exactly like a hemangioma on CT. It's a hemangioma. You know, we know that. It's pathognomonic on CT. It's, you know, we, you should not call this a metastatic lesion. Uh, things like this, like Paget's disease, could have uptake as well. So this is just to reinforce the fact that even though it stands for PSMA, we still need to be careful. And there's a learning curve with this. So solitary rib lesions is probably the, 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 one of the biggest pitfalls right now with PSMA PET. I think a lot, once you start doing this, the radiologist starts reading it. They see a little bit of activity in one of the ribs. And often either they'll call it a MET or they'll hedge. You know, if you see a solitary focus of uptake in the rib, or it's reported, and on CT, it clearly looks like a metastatic lesion. It's blastic, it's expansile, or whatnot. Yeah, it's probably a MET. That being said, 99% of those cases aren't like that. 99% of the cases are usually just a little bit of uptake in the rib, nothing on CT, uh, and in those cases, it's not a metastatic lesion. So this article, which I cited earlier, can we go back? A couple slides? Yeah. Uh, all right, good. One more. Go back one. Sorry. Solitary rib lesions. Um, it says here, oh, don't rely on SUV max alone. It's not sufficient to determine malignancy. Um, solitary rib cannot be just... Basically, a solitary rib lesion on a PSMA pet should not be called metastatic disease. All right? So just that's a take-home message, an important take-home message. Uh, if there are multiple lesions, then it gets different. If there's multiple lesions outside of the ribs and then there's a rib lesion, that's different as well. But again, if you're just getting a report that talks about a single rib lesion, you know, take pause, it's probably not metastatic. So take home point number two, what you see is only half the story. So this is a, a recent example that we had where, all right, this is the PSMA pet. Here's the pet in an axial slice and here's the fused. This is just bladder. So when the urologist goes to look at this, they're thinking, oh, this is weird, because on the report, they're talking about this focus of intense activity in the right aspect of the prostate gland. But when the urologist looks at it, you don't really see much. You're kind of like, uh, what are they doing? Um, but turns out, if you rewindow it, you see the activity in it much better. So uh, this happens because what you see in the PACs is not a, always a true representation of what is out there because it's a dynamic process when you're interpreting a PET CT. You window, you re-window, and what the technologist is sending to PET or on the PACs is just a snapshot. So be careful. If there's a discordance between what you're reading on the report versus what you're seeing in the images, I think that's a trigger for you to reach out to the person reading the study to, to ask some questions. Um, so, and then take home number three, clinical context is important. It's very important that uh, the radiologist know, you know, is it pre-diagnosed, is it, you know, pre-definitive therapy, is it biochemical occurrence, what's the PSA, what was the Gleason score? 
just a, it helps to know what your pretest probability is. Oftentimes in our practice, because we're a large integrated center, our EMRs are connected. We'll go into the EMR, get their last report, uh, their last clinic visit, read through it, and that gives me a sense of sort of what I'm looking for, how aggressive is the patient's disease. And this is something that don't, doesn't necessarily occur in every outpatient center, but it's something that hopefully will change over time as the imaging specialties recognize the importance of understanding the clinical states better. Uh, but regardless, every time there's an opportunity to reach out to, to you know, your, your colleagues, it's a great opportunity to learn. And it's also a great opportunity to educate them about you know, some of the, the, the disease and what you go through as a, as a urologist or oncologist every day. Take home point number four, SUV. So we all hear SUV, we, we seem to love it. And we love it because it's a number and it's something that we can really attach ourselves to. But we joke oftentimes in our specialty that it doesn't really stand for standard uptake value. It's actually silly, useless value. Uh, and there's a lot of truth in that because you could do a pet in the same person within 24 hours and get different results with, the, with regards to the quantification. You know, we did a study using FDG PET CT and we saw variabilities of up to 30 to 50%. You know, with PSMA, I don't think it'd be quite as big because FDG is, is glucose and, you know, the way the body metabolizes glucose is a lot more dynamic. But that being said, there's other variables in the whole process when you come, when you calculate these SUVs. So I think it is kind of important that SUV is included in the reports. I don't think it's that important. And if you look back to the vision trial, they actually don't talk about numbers. They actually talk about how it compares to liver and how it compares to background. That's the trigger to me of something being more suspicious versus less suspicious. Um, but you know, moving forward when it comes to treatment response, yes, I think SUV will be a little bit more important. And this sort of, I just talked about it, but it talks about the repeatability of SUV and oncologic FDG PET CTs. So when, when it comes to things like PERSIS, which is a response criteria that was in, like, proposed using PET, you actually had to see a change of at least 25 to 30% before you call it progression. And that's kind of what we use in our practice as well. Um, you know, as you work with your local radiologist group or Nuke Med group, this is something that I think it would be important to propose. You know, there's reporting criteria out there, um, and it's published here in the, in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine, where instead of it gives sort of a little bit more of a standard lexicon. So one could be a score of one. It's kind of like pyrads, but for a PSMA pet, you know, one could be benign lesion, two probably benign, three equivocal, four probably five definitive. Uh, and a lot of this is based on you know the activity compared to deliver and other you know standard areas of activity. So you know, propose this. Honestly, I think it's challenging oftentimes to force them to change, but you know, it's a discussion, and I think it's a tool that's out there that hopefully people might be able to integrate into their practices. Uh, we talked about radar six and seven. Um, again, this is our procedure guideline that was a joint statement between the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and the Society of Nuclear Medicine. Great resource, but it'll, it's gonna change and we're gonna need to continue to update that. So in summary, all that is hot is not prostate cancer, right? So just make sure you remember that. Number two, what you see is only half the story. So I think it's great when you actually look at your own imaging, but make sure if there's questions or there's something that's a little odd, reach out to your you know, local radiologist or nuke med who read it. And if you don't know who the person is who read it, I think that's a problem because radiology is not a commodity. You know, I think it's important. Like Everyone knows who their urologist is, who their medoc is. You should know who your radiologist is as well because I think they're an important part of the team. Uh, and as we transition into that therapeutic piece, you want to know who that person is who's going to treat that patient with the radiopharmaceuticals down the line. Um, and it's important to create that multidisciplinary team in your own community. And be careful with the numbers. Again, SUV is a, is, is a nice tool, uh, but used carelessly, it really is a silly, useless value. Uh, 